All right, it is now 1.30, so we are going to go ahead and get started, although a few more people may trickle in. But welcome to the 2020 Watershed Congress. This is Wednesday, day three of our virtual Watershed Congress week, and we are so very excited for you to join us today, wherever you may be in the world. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with organizations like Stroud Water Research Center, who is moderating and presenting your session today as part of our mission to advance knowledge and stewardship of freshwater systems through global research, education, and watershed restoration. My name is Mandy Nix, Watershed Education Specialist at the Stroud Center and member of the Watershed Congress Organizing Committee. I am also your moderator for this session, Spatio-Temporal Patterns of Stream Conductivity and Temperature in the Delaware Basin with Stroud Water Research Center's very own Dr. Deanna Oviedo Vargas, uh, David Bressler, and Dr. Mark Peacock. Before I turn the session over to our presenters, I have a few quick announcements. Dave, if you want to hit to the next slide. First, I'd like to briefly pause in recognition of the myriad organizations, individuals, and partners who made today's conference possible. This is the first ever virtual conference, so thank you greatly to all of these partners. All right, next slide, David. For this session, we are in a presentation. So we are going to take audience questions after the presentation for roughly 10 to 15 minutes. And to do that, we will use the Q&A feature found in the bottom toolbar of your Zoom window. That's down there in the bottom toolbar where you can mute or look at the video or also hit Q&A. But the chat will also be open if you have any comments or observations, and I'll be posting guidance for using the chat very shortly. Next slide, David, for your first one. Now this presentation is being recorded. Recorded presentations will be made available on the 2020 Watershed Congress playlist on the Delaware Riverkeeper Network's YouTube channel. You'll receive an email when presentations from this week are posted there. Finally, this week we are using the hashtag Watershed Congress for social sharing on Twitter or Facebook, so get out there and tag us virtually. And it is at last time for our presentation. Spatio-Temporal Patterns of Stream Conductivity and Temperature in the Delaware Basin. I am so pleased to present our speakers again. David Bressler, Citizen Science Facilitator with a Bachelor of Arts in Biology and Anthropology, a Master of Environmental Management, Water, Air, and Resources, and a Master of Education in Science Education. Also, we're here to present Dr. Diana Oviedo Vargas, Watershed Biogeochemist with a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, and a PhD in environmental science. And lastly, Dr. Mark Peacock, aquatic ecologist with a Bachelor of Science in environmental science and a PhD in ecology. David, take it off as our first presenter. Oh, David, you are on mute. Sorry there. about that, guys. Um, so I'm Dave. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, this project we've been working on. Specifically, I'm going to talk about continuous data as a lead in to Deanna and Mark's presentations. Deanna's going to be talking conductivity. Mark's going to be talking temperature. Um, so I'm going to give a bit of a project overview, and then I'm going to give an overview of continuous data, specifically talking about what continuous data are why continuous data are useful, and what it takes to get good continuous data. So the project, citizen science using Enviro DIY monitoring stations in the Delaware Basin. These, are, uh, these DIY stations are, are designed by Stroud Center, and we're doing this in association with the Delaware River Watershed Initiative, a William Penn Foundation funded project. Um, so what are continuous data? Well, they're measurements taken in regular interval intervals automatically with an instrument that is installed in the stream. So this is our uh, instrument here. It's installed in the stream. We're taking measurements every five minutes. They're being recorded um, for the parameters that we're gonna talk about today, conductivity and temperature, but we're also getting other parameters like depth and turbidity. Those data are sent to monitor my watershed where the data can be summarized and uh, put into these nice uh, time series plots. 
So this is the station we're using. It's designed by Shannon Hicks, an engineer at Str the Stroud Center. Uh, just a brief overview. There's the data logger in the Mayfly data logger in a waterproof box um, powered by a battery that is charged with solar panels. We have a CTD sensor uh, and generally a turbidity sensor as well. As I mentioned, these sensors are installed in the stream for continuous logging. We've deployed over 70 stations across the Delaware Basin. Um, and the stations are owned by over 40 different watershed groups, universities, and schools across the basin. So Stroud is supporting them using the stations. So um, what's the use of continuous data? Um, so just a little bit of a summary here. It gives you a fuller story um, about your uh, stream. And it, you know, with every five minute data, you can really pretty easily know where you're at presently with your stream. And since the data are accumulated, you can track where you came from and you can predict where you may be going with the data. Um, so measurements are taken automatically, right? No person necessary, less time and effort, lots of different loggers that you can do this with and set for different time intervals, collect different types of data. And it is uh, pretty simple, but at the same time, it does take actually take time and effort. And I'll get to that in a little bit. So um, to compare the continuous data to sort of more of a standard approach, which is single point measurements um, using like a handheld meter that you put in the stream and you get a single measurement. Um, or you collect a grab sample, which involves, you know, rinsing your bottle, um, labeling the, the sample, sending it off to a lab for analysis. And all that takes a, quite a bit, a lot of time and effort as well as money. Um, so to talk a little bit about um, the continuous data that we're working with. I'm just going to go through some different plots and sort of point out general patterns we're seeing as well as pointing out how the continuous data are helpful uh, in comparison to uh, grab samples or single point measurements. So one of the major patterns we see very regularly in these streams is this dilution pattern where uh, stormwater comes into the stream. You can see that here as depth increases and the conductivity in the stream is, goes down due to dilution of ion concentration. So the stormwater contains lower conductivity water than what's in the stream, it enters the stream, and as depth goes up, the conductivity goes down. And you can see that pattern repeated throughout the year. Now, the one time where you don't necessarily see that pattern is in the, is in the winter when you have situations like this where salt that's applied to the road uh, does its business, does its melting of the ice, and then the water goes into the storm drain or wherever and goes into the stream. And instead of seeing a dilution of uh, conductivity in the stream, you see these spikes. So water goes in and the conductivity goes up to the, due to these loads of salt that are put into the streams. Another common pattern we see with conductivity is urban streams. So urban streams, this has been shown across the country that generally urban streams have higher conductivity because of all the different uh, pollutants, dissolved ions going into the water, road salt being a major contributor there. So we have here three sites, urban streams compared to forested streams, and you can see a substantial difference in the conductivity values between those. Um, moving to temperature, we certainly see a seasonality with water temperature. Um, you can see here starting in the fall, continuing through the winter where we have the bottom level of the te temperature as you, would be, as you would expect and then moving up to the summer and we see this pattern repeating. Now these daily measurements, you can see that there are points here where you have warming here in the winter, a major peak. You can imagine if you're taking single samples through here, maybe once a week or once a month, even daily, you're not necessarily going to be able to show all of these different uh, movements of water temperature occurring in the stream. So I mentioned the uh, daily fluctuations. Here we see the diol, day and night pattern in temperature. Um, and you can again imagine that if you were taking a single measurement once a week or even once a day, you're really not going to be able to capture this um, 
pretty dramatic change in temperature as the days go on. So getting into some more uh, unique type situations with the, con with the continuous data, we have thermal pollution in certain situations in the summertime. Here we see stormwater uh, coming into the stream with these depth increases. And then we see a, a pretty major change in temperature, increase in temperature during those times. And that's attributed to the rainwater falling on hot, hot asphalt and that uh, water being carried into the stream and having a pretty big influence here on Valley Creek of the um, stream temperatures. And that's obviously an important factor with regard to trout. And then in a longer term, you know, this temperature data allows for considering considerations of streams for trout management. So here we can see some New Jersey DEP um, trout uh, thresholds or, or criteria. And we can see that this um, continuous temperature data, certainly, um, you know, you can relate it to those, uh, those criteria and consider management strategies. Um, one other uh, occurrence to point out is these sort of rare events that aren't necessarily associated with storms. So this is a situation that was at Pickering Creek and there were these, um, random conductivity spikes going on that were not associated with depth. Um, so those are, you know, just sort of a, a opportunity to see, you know, short periods of time in which things are happening in the stream where if you were taking a single, single sample, you really probably wouldn't detect these changes in the stream. So all this sounds pretty easy. The station's in there, it does it all and gives you this, all this nice data to look at. Um, you know, that we can pass on to folks like Mark and Diana to analyze and um, come up with interesting results. But um, water and weather are pretty destructive. Sensors foul easily. People and creatures do damage to these stations. Here we've got a couple stations that were knocked into the water by storms. Here's a station that was vandalized. The whole internal contents of the station were stolen. Here's a wire that was chewed by a rodent. Here's some sensors that are fouled, algae growth and sediment accumulation and then sediment burial. So what does it take to keep these sensors functioning? Well, it really takes people. And that's where our citizen scientists have come in as well as professionals from the watershed groups. And the main roles that these folks have played are cleaning sensors, monitoring the live feed of the data to monitor my watershed so that they can keep track of things and identify when problems do arise, um, and also doing quality con control checks to ensure that the data coming from the stations are indeed accurate. So what we see here is a situation in which the sensor was dirty, it was cleaned, and it shifted the conductivity readings pretty substantially. So that's the type of thing that you know, keeps you on track with good data. Um, monitoring the data on Monitor My Watershed, there's a legend here that describes how uh, recent your data have been fed in. So you see here, oh, my site's yellow. I haven't gotten data within the last two weeks. Well, something's going on with data transmission. Or a situation like this where you have uh, odd uh, data patterns that it might indicate a malfunction of a sensor. And then keeping track of power at the stations uh, is a super important uh, component of, of the of the citizen science work. And then lastly, quality control checks, basically just going out with a handheld meter or taking a grab sample to cross check against uh, the sensor data. So in this little example situation, you go out with a calibrated meter and it reads different than the station. It immediately throws up a red flag. Your numbers are not matching up and there's likely a problem with your, with your um, sensor station data. So what are our take homes here? Well, continuous data can help to develop a fuller picture of a stream. We see that you know, in these images that I just showed where you just are tracking data over time and you're just seeing a direct um, readout of what's happening in the stream according to those parameters. We see also that the long-term patterns as well as short-term and rare events can all be detected. Um, but Something to keep in mind really is that although these stations are automated, they really need quite a bit of attention and uh, a, a good amount of quality control really to ensure that the data are reliable. And just a final point here is that state agencies and other regulators are 
beginning to um, incorporate these types of data. So as we move forward, hopefully that can be more of a um, direction that we go in. So moving on to uh, Diana with conductivity and then Mark with temperature. And I'll just say thank you and leave that for a second, I guess. And I will. Thanks, Dave. Um, I will yeah. start sharing my screen now. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for attending. Uh, is it on full screen now? Yes. Yes, it is, Deanna. Looks great. All right. Um, let me turn my camera on. Sorry about that. Takes a while to go to full screen and I don't know if I, all right, there we go. All right, well, thanks Dave and thank you Mandy for organizing um, and everybody for participating in this um, in this session. As um, Mandy and Dave said, my name is Diana Oyedo Vargas. I am a research scientist at the Stratwater Research Center. I will tell you a little bit about um, spatial and temporal patterns in specific conductivity in tributaries of the Delaware River Basin. Um, so just a little bit of background here, electric conductivity is a measurement of a concentration of chemicals that can transfer electric current in water. Um, we typically measure it with a handheld conductivity meter or using automatic uh, deployable sensors like uh, the ones that we use in our network in the um, Delaware River um, Watershed Initiative. Um, conductivity is reported in units of milli or micro siemens per centimeter um, and another term that is commonly used to um, which is equivalent to electric conductivity is conductance electric conductance i will be talking about specific conductivity which is electric conductivity that has been corrected for temperature um, conductivity is temperature dependent so it's Small variations um, that happen with temperature can be corrected and most of the sensors that are um, used nowadays report specific conductivity. So in any uh, freshwater ecosystem, specific conductivity will depend on the chemicals uh, that can transfer electric current that are present in that water. Water itself, pure water, actually is a dielectric substance. It doesn't conduct electricity. What does is the salts, the salts that are dissolved in that water. So natural water, natural waters will have um, dissolved salts which contribute uh, or make up most of the conductivity that we observe. What is a salt? Um, it's a chemical compound that is made uh, of atoms with negative and positive charges, which we call ions. They can be positively, when, when they're positively charged, we call them cations. If they're negatively charged, we call them um, anions. What you see here in this little diagram is um, the crystalline structure of sodium chloride or salt, table salt. You see the negative ions uh, are chloride, positive uh, ions are sodium. And salts actually, when you have them in their solid states uh, as crystals, they do not transfer electricity. They are often used as insulators. However, when they are in water, um, if they are soluble, not all salts are soluble in water. Some of them are uh, highly soluble, some partially, some not at all. Um, but in water, their ions, anions and cations separate and become um, hydrated or solvated by the water molecules. And when that happens is when salts are capable of transferring electricity. So there is a natural concentration, a natural abundance of salts, dissolved salts in aquatic ecosystems, of course, that is driven by the type of soil and the geologic materials that you find in the watershed. Uh, so just a, so a little example here, um, there's just two contrasting systems in the United States, uh, which are uh, watersheds with very little human activities, or zero human activities. Uh, the Chubb River in the Adirondack Mountains, for example, has a specific conductivity of about or average 50 microsiemens per centimeter. Very low compared to the Dolores River in Utah, uh, which has a, an average specific conductivity of 
2,000 microsiemens per centimeter. And by just looking at the pictures, you imagine the landscape is very different. Um, the geologic formations that are drained by these two um, rivers are very different. And if we look at a larger picture here, this is a model. Um, so it's important, this is model is not um, actual measured specific conductivity, model created by Olson and Cormier that was published last year that shows what background specific conductivity would be across the United States. And you can see the scale ranges for from 10 to around 2000 microsiemens per centimeter. It, by looking at the image, you realize that the geology plays a very important role here in what, uh, what we would see as natural variation in specific conductivity. Now, what we have been observing though in the last um, few decades is that there is an increased uh, concentration of salts in aquatic ecosystems in the United States and across the wor world, which well, we have been referring to as uh, freshwater salinization syndrome. This increased concentration uh, of salts in the United States um, has affected nearly 40% of the watersheds um, and it's most prominent in the densely populated areas of the country, the Eastern and Midwestern US. Causes for increased salinity or the salinization um, include salt pollution, uh, like Dave was mentioning, from uh, road um, ice application, irrigation runoff and sewage, but also processes um, such as accelerated weathering that um, of natural geologic materials that happen when we have strong acids and activities such as acid uh, or processes such as acid rain, but also the use of fertilizers and acid mine drainage have decreased the pH, which has um, have accelerated that weathering. Another process is the use of materials that can be easily weathered in, in human activities, in agriculture, particularly lime, and in urbanization, the use of concrete. Those are so, um, materials that can uh, weather easily and contribute to this salt load that we see now in a, a lot of our aquatic ecosystems. That what we call that salt is really not only sodium and chloride but that sometimes we just think about as the components of um, table salt, but also substances like uh, magnesium, potassium, sulfate, and carbonate, and many others. Uh, so this is really the list of the things that we have looked more closely at, but um, we know now that there's other uh, substances that are also, or other salts that are also contributing to this increased salinity. So specific conductivity um, represents a, an excellent proxy for understanding changes in salt concentration and um, can help us really track uh, the salinization syndrome and the advantages that um, that we have with uh, conductivity, like Dave was saying, is that we can get continuous measurements for very, um, you know, they're un inexpensive and conductivity sensor, uh, sensors are very reliable. So we can get very good continuous data with a um, relatively cheap sensor. So to give you an idea of how specific conductivity has been so valuable in understanding the salinization syndrome, this is a publication by Kashel and colleagues from a couple of years ago, um, where they show in nine rivers across um, the United States how specific conductivity has been increasing um, in the last 70 years or so, in, in some cases um, doubling or tripling. And why is this a problem? Well, because these variations in concentrations of salt make it harder for freshwater organisms to maintain osmotic balance. There is an increased energy demand that they need to accommodate or to um, adapt to these con different conditions. And that has uh, been shown to cause effects, uh, negative effects such as delayed growth, reduced feeding efficiency, uh, increased drift, and alterations of processes such as uh, tropic, uh, trophic interactions, which would be uh, who eats who, and bio biochemical cycles, and um, leaf decomposition. So all these can have um, negative cascading effects on the health of um, our freshwater ecosystems. Um, so the question we're trying to answer with the uh, conductivity, the specific conductivity data that we have for the, the Delaware uh, River 
Basin network is, are the tributaries of the basin experience, experiencing increased salinization? Um, so I'll give you, just a, a show you a few graphs with a little bit of um, some of the data that we have collected um, or have been collecting. This uh, first graph here is showing you specific conductivity for um, all this, for 50 out of the, our 70 plus uh, sites and um, which had data available in 2017 and 2018. And um, the scale here is micro, in microsiemens per centimeter from zero to 50,000 microsiemens per centimeter. You can see if you are familiar with what these numbers mean, there are many sites in which conductivity is high. Um, it's so high, these are box plots, but you can't really see them. So, and the next graph here, I have changed the scale. So you're looking at the same thing, except with a zero to 1500 scale. The box plots represent the variation in all those data points that were collected throughout that year. Um, and so, first thing to notice is across 50 sites, there is a huge spatial variation. And that temporal variation is represented by that variation in the box and then the, the circles um, above and below the box. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea, uh, seawater has a specific conductivity of around 30,000. So a few sites experience every so often conductivities that are higher than that um, or very close to what's um, the salinity of the ocean. And um, just to compare with what the model um, has for what we would expect as specific conductivity in our area, uh, the red line there represents the 300 microsiemens per centimeter. This is not perfect, of course, this is a model and uh, doesn't really show a lot of the uh, spatial variation um, or as clearly, but so this just gives you an idea that definitely we are seeing that many of the sites are experiencing increased um, specific conductivity. And as you can imagine, it looks like that's mostly driven by um, development. And so this graph here shows uh, the specific, the mean specific conductivity for all those 50 sites across percent developed land. That was the best predictor um, just by doing a simple um, correlation analysis. Um, but I wanted to touch just in a, a, on a couple of sites just to give you an idea of how that temporal um, variation and the spatial variation is so important, so useful, how the, uh, the continuous data can really help us uh, see very subtle um, in ch changes and differences, similar to what um, Dave was talking about. So I'll show you results for these two sites. One is mostly forested and the other one is mostly developed. Um, they um, are near Reading, Angelica Creek and Punches Run. They are very close to each other. In fact, Punches Run is actually a tributary of Angelica Creek. They're only three miles away. Um, Punches Run again is nested within the Angelica Creek, much smaller, mostly forested. Um, and then, but Angelica, even though it does have a 50% forest in the watershed, has urbanization and agricultural activities as well. Um, the box plot here is basically what we were looking at before. It shows you the variation, the temporal variation, the, the, the actual box is the um, fifth to 95th percentile of the data in the average, um, the line in the middle of the average. So, it averages around 120 microsiemens per centimeter. Angelica Creek is more like 400 uh, microsiemens per centimeter on average, but you see there is a lot of um, cases of low conductivity throughout the year. Uh, Angelica has a lot of cases of high conductivity throughout the year. Just to compare them uh, more directly, I changed the scale here for punches run to 1200, so it matches that, than that of Angelica, and you see that systems that are nested within uh, each other and they're so close can have such different um, uh, distribution in, in the conductivity. We look at what that looks throughout um, a, a few months here from December 2019 to April of 2020. Uh, you can see that variation day was talking about where we see decreased uh, conductivity where we have rain events in punches run that's very clear. One is 
uh, water depth is basically the mirror image of conductivity. But uh, in the sum, in the winter months, we do see in Angelica Creek uh, that effect of most likely the, the application of road salt where during the rain, during uh, rain events or, or precipitation events in the winter time, conductivity actually increases. And in some cases, significantly, um, it gets to be very high. Um, okay, so that was what I was talking about. The one other thing that I wanted to show you as an example of how the, the beauty of this continuous data is something um, like the dial variation that we see in specific conductivity that you wouldn't be able really to tell unless you are looking at continuous data. In many sites in the watershed, in, uh, and it, this is a very common process everywhere, um, specific conductivity can change to, uh, during the day for a number of reasons, but in this case it's likely because of photosynthesis. When we have um, increased photosynthesis during the day um, that consumes carbon dioxide, that raises the pH of the water, which causes um, that some salts are not able to be as soluble, things like carbonate, for example. And less contribution of carbonate means less conductivity. So you see that in the middle of the day, specific conductivity drops. Um, and this happens both in, in um, Angelica Creek and in Punches Run. Uh, the data you're looking here is, uh, is for, from, for, yeah, from Punches Run. So in summary, we find that yes, tributaries of the basin are experiencing increased salinity uh, that is related to land use and urbanization. And uh, we see that the winter extremes are likely related to road salt application. And I'd like to uh, finish by saying that the knowledge on salt toxicity is rapid, rapidly increasing. And we now understand very well that there is negative added additive effects of salinity and other stressors. So um, salinity makes things work for, worse for other stressors and the other way around too. Other stressors can, can make salinity effects being even worse. Uh, however, there's still a lot more to learn both for us with uh, regard to the wonderful data set that we have in the Delaware River Basin, but also in general about soil toxicity. So I'd like to thank our collaborators and funders and of course um, the, um, as the different organizations that contribute to this network. With that, I'd like to thank you guys. I guess we have time for questions at the end and I will um, now I'll stop sharing my screen so Mark can. Um, oh, you don't have to stop Deanna. He can just steal from you if you remember. Yeah. Brilliant. Which one are you saying? The good one? Uh, now we can share your full screen. Do you see your full screen? Yeah. Okay. I think we're behind the schedule a little bit, so I'm just gonna jump right on it. So, um, because of multiple factors, and perhaps climate change is the most notorious and well-known, um, stream temperatures are rising. And what you're looking at here is a subset of thousands of locations across the continental US where stream temperature is being recorded. And what they show is that, first of all, there is some variation, not every stream is warming up, but about 65%, so something close to set out of seven out of uh, 10 streams are showing signs of warming conditions. Therefore, a good question is what are the consequences of this warming and what should we expect? Well, um, temperature really is one, if not the most, uh, elemental control on life and um, on biology in many, in many ways. And one that is uh, very well known and quite significant is the effects of temperature on dissolved oxygen. This is uh, a purely physical process, but it, what, what tells us is that warmer, warmer waters uh, have a lower amount of oxygen in them. In other words, uh, when water gets warmer, the amount of oxygen that can actually hold, therefore the availability of that oxygen for fish, insects, and any life form decreases, making it uh, harder for life to thrive in them. Temperature or increasing temperature also have effects on algae. 
algae likes uh, warm waters and when uh, we warm the streams and rivers we promote these increases of nuisance uh, very unpleasant to look sometimes unpleasant to smell and at the same time the algae can draw down oxygen in the middle of the night and that can cause some fish mortality too so another issue related to oxygen through the algae growth uh, temperature also increases toxicity and we have a long history at the Stroud Center studying how increasing temperatures uh, make certain um, certain pollutants like in this case chloride uh, more toxic our entomology team has been uh, known to show that at a greater temperatures toxicity of um, most pollutants increase and finally and perhaps this is the most popular one temperature drives fish habitat because many of the game fish and especially uh, popular species like trout well they have an optimal range of temperatures where they like to to, to leave they, they can reproduce they can grow they can they can uh, thrive in them but once we change those thermal regimes kind of make it hard for them to keep up with their metabolism and because temperature also is negatively related to oxygen we kind of make twice as hard for them not only by changing only temperature but suddenly there's less oxygen available they have a much harder time breeding and, and surviving especially the young ones in those environments so there's plenty of good reasons to think about keeping an eye on temperature and it's a great parameter very unifying to understand a lot about ecosystem health but unfortunately it's easy to measure and much harder to actually understand the causes behind it. And we really got to keep an eye on time and space. And I'm going to emphasize this multiple times that the uh, variation over time and variation among locations, they're really intertwined. It's very hard to separate them. And, uh, Dave Bressler was touching on this a little bit. If we look at over time and we see these day or day night fluctuations of high temperatures around two in the afternoon, lowers in the middle of the night. And this is a 10 day example, up and down, up and down. Sometimes these ranges are, you know, three, four Celsius, degrees Celsius, which is quite a significant change. So if we are taking one sample at 9 a.m. at one side and at five in the afternoon at another side, we can really get to wrong conclusions that there's something uh, wrong or different in these systems when we are just catching this um, day or this day night variation through this that at the same time you know this goes on that's why this is so wiggly but if we look at the bigger picture there is a seasonality a very clear pattern not surprisingly this would be somewhere in here would be the summer and especially well uh, in this part of the northeast that's where uh, warmest temperature tend to be and the more dramatic warming temperatures will be will be in the summertime there is this seasonality component so that helps because sometimes we can just say let's concentrate on the summertime and then we can start bringing bringing in the effects of uh, space we can compare sites if we just uh, collect summer data for instance or we just look at summer data and we compare that among sites really among sites or, or over space um, there are a variety of, of uh, factors that may drive changes in temperature but really today I want to focus on the land use in the watershed and mainly two things when we're thinking of an ideal forested water forested watershed well first of all and evidently there will be more shade especially if those trees are near the stream but also there's a greater amount of infiltration when it rains a bigger part of that water will make it uh, through the ground where it can cool down and then join the stream through these groundwater paths. In ag agricultural watersheds, and especially urban watersheds with all this pavement, uh, not only we eliminate most, if not all, of the shading ability, but also we have much less water percolating the soil, joining the groundwater, and then getting into the stream. And obviously, if you have a smaller uh, water quantities, if you have a smaller creek, a smaller water body, it takes much less heat to change the temperature of that a stream that if you have more water so land use by changing water quantity and and, and um, impairing shading can really make a difference at, at a stream which will mostly show up when we are comparing different systems so my my point as i said is to make clear that you know space and time very so are so related to each other that it's, we can always 
we always have to look at them as, as a single unit. And what, I, what I'm showing here is uh, 10 of these 70 sites where we're monitoring temperature. And I ranked them. So we're like lowest or coldest temperature. This is mean temperature in January. And here are some examples, Little Lehigh, Pickering Creek, and Cops Creek at the top. That's eight Celsius degrees in, the, in January, which is pretty warm. So this is from coldest to warmest. And if we start going through the year by looking at mean monthly temperatures, we realize that things move a lot. You know, this ranking is showing mass changing rapidly. For instance, Cops Creek now is down here. In the summertime, it's the coldest creek. And when it gets uh, in the wintertime, it is the warmest one. And many others, it is almost impossible to keep up with all this shuffling. Things change rapidly uh, over space and time. Having all these high resolution data really allow us to say, okay, now we've seen there's a lot of variation among sites over time. Let's look at the fine detail, let's look at what's happened. For instance, in the case of Cups Creek, how is that this system is not really showing much seasonality? It's keeping warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Well, it turns out that this sensor is located right at the output, it's flowing this way. It's right, right at the output of a completely urban watershed and it's, it's piped underneath. Therefore, in the summer, all this pave keeps the sun away from it, it cools it down. In the winter, it actually warms it up because it is also functions like a good radiation, radiative body, and keep, keep, uh, keeping all the heat in here. So knowing the location and seeing variation over time are, are kind of, you can't, you can't just take one of the two. But as I said before, sometimes when you really want to assess one of them, what you can do is to simplify one or the other. For instance, we can really take just the summer stream temperature. We know that's when the river, no matter where it is, will get hotter. And what you're looking here are 15 of those watersheds with very different land use. And we're looking at daily average temperature over the summer. You can see a beautiful gradient. They are also ordered from somewhere 15 degrees in the summer, daily average in the summer to 23. That's quite significant. And here are some of the examples I was showing before in that ranking. That's their average conditions. We know that if we were to look over the year, these, they, would, they would move around. There's a lot, quite a bit of variation. But it's also surprising that even that things are so uh, complex and that interaction over space and time, where you are and when you measure, we can actually see some patterns at the watershed scale and we can link land use to average temperatures. For instance, uh, average summer temperature, on average, I can't say that enough, it does show the pattern we would expect. Forested watersheds on average are cooler than urban and ag and mixed watersheds kind of follow this beautiful gradient. And there's a lot of variation again, but it is a striking that we can actually see some differences just by relating land use uh, coverage and average temperatures. And actually, uh, we can even find some statistically significant relationships by just plotting a correlation between the amount of forest in the watershed and the average summer temperature. And that is surprising because really, with all that variation, you're usually not able to see much at the larger scale. And temperature seems to hold up in this case. In fact, if we, we accept this correlation, uh, and it holds on as we add more data into it. You know, what, what this is telling us is that adding about a 10% of forested area in the watershed would generate more or less a half a degree decrease in the water. So in an ideal imaginary situation, if we were to forest an entire watershed, we could on average cool that system down about five degrees. Now, we know it's not that easy, but it's also interesting that there are some uh, differences in terms of land use that hold up at this large scale. But again, um, we can really go farther with the sensors. The good thing about the sensor data is that you can always get what you get when you grab one sample. But if you only have one sample, you, you can't go any further than that. Here, we can do these plots, we can get the big picture, and then we can go in and say, let's, let's for instance, compare a system that has almost no forest, and that's Cops Creek, which you already been introduced to, which is about 21 degrees uh, on average in the summer, and Aquashicola, which is about 81% forested, uh, which is a pretty you know, forested watershed, at least one of the, one of the best in this uh, network. 
And you know, there's a substantial difference in, on average, about two, three degrees. But what if we actually put all that information together? We can generate plots like that, which you kind of, you know, they're called heat, heat maps or heat plots. <laughs> it's, it's very obvious that are pretty appropriate for this, comparing again, Cubs Creek, more urban, Aquashicola, more forest. And you're looking at here, at hourly stream temperatures. So, you know, we could go a little farther than that, but that's pretty detailed. And uh, blue colors are cold, um, cold waters, yellow colors are warmer. And here is a full year. Those are the, all the months. And your time of the day is on the vertical axis. So for instance, you see this stripe here in a Kwashiakala that it tends to be warmer no matter what month, especially in the summer. Well, that's that two to five window over the course of the day. And that's like, looking at this is when we can start saying, okay, well, it turns out that Cobbs Creek during the summer, it's not that different from an almost completely forested watershed. But look at the look at this, look at the winter months, or look at the, over the course of the year. I don't see that a diel seasonality that we see in a forested creek. Or look at the end of the of the summer when things are supposed to start cooling down, it's still pretty hot with Cobbs Creek. All this is what kind of gets us or allows us to elevate our um, understanding when we want to use these data to inform uh, data uh, decision makers and stakeholders and for instance use this data to assess can the system hold cold water fish or should we be stocking trout in this fish in this in this stream and we just not only rely on one value we can ask questions like how many hours a day this fish will be exposed to water temperatures that exceed cold water criteria? How many hours a day will exceed stocking criteria? How many consecutive days? We have all that information. And if we zoom in, that's kind of very similar plot the one we're just zooming in and assessing, for instance, for a summer of 2018, I put most, those are mostly the same streams I've been using in the previous plots. And here are hours a day that we are over this threshold of, of a cold water fish. Um, Punches Creek, for instance, perfect scenario. We can easily find trout here. Look at Aquashicola, even that technically a well forested, and there are many, many days that we are still 15, 16 hours a day exceeding the cold water criteria. So trout would definitely having a hard time in this creek. Cubs Creek, it's doing pretty well until the late of the summer when it's supposed to be cooling and it's not. Others are, of course, not even close to it, being able to hold trout or to allow trout to, to survive and do well. Uh, same with stocking temperature, those criteria are much less restrictive. So uh, most of the creeks here uh, would be allowed to be, or would be in regulation to be stocked, but some others like Marsh and Wissahickon, they're still not quite there. Although it's interesting that we can see that it's only for half the summer, not the entire of the summer. So we can really make very informative decisions about um, fish and stream temperatures among different locations and assessing different variation. So in summary, I've got a couple of minutes. Um, again, I want to emphasize that this temperature data helps, it's, it's fairly easy to measure and it's a, it's a sensor, a temperature sensor that's fairly easy to maintain. But the irony is that it's quite difficult to understand this complex interaction between land use and temporal effects. As you as you've seen, temperature, temperature can vary the same within a single stream over 24 hours than among two systems over two different seasons. There's a lot of variation at small and large scales. Even that a larger scale is, is comforting that we can still identify cooling effects or some patterns that hold on and we can see a clear um, relation between forested watersheds having a positive effect on stream temperatures, cooling them down. And at the same time, having all these uh, fine scale resolution, just not for fun, but actually allows us to really make a much better decision on where is it that we should be putting our um, resources to try to bring fish, try, try to bring back trout, or try to restock for recreation purpose and, and all that. So we're, we certainly hope that we can use the, the, these data in the, in the future, or that it, the data will be used in the future uh, to inform some of these decisions. Uh, just like Diana, to acknowledge and say thanks to all collaborators, to citizen science who do the work, and all the funders. And I think right on time for questions. Mandy.
Thank you so much, Mark, Deanna, and also Dave Bressler uh, for giving a lot of clarity. And I know that there's some more clarity that's needed right now from the question and answers. And thank you everyone who's contributed to that. We are gonna answer those live. I'm gonna do my best to go in order, but also as they relate to some of the answers we're getting from Mark, Deanna, and David. And our presenters can kind of answer how organically it works for them. If they know the answer, they can hop right on in. Uh, so our first question that we're gonna ask uh, came from a participant who wants to know, does the sediment of legacy salts affect the future of a stream or can just future adjustment of municipal practices in turn solely turn around the health of a stream? Again, that question was, does the sediment of legacy salts affect the future of a stream? Or can we just adjust future adjustment of municipal practices in turn solely turn around the health of a stream? And Dave Bressler did go ahead and give a stab at that in the chat. And he was thinking, Deanna can comment further, but yes, we are seeing elevated salt content in streams during the summer. This is apparently from salt accumulation in the soil. So adjusting practices will certainly help, but there is already salt in the soil that is getting into streams throughout the year. All right, Mark, Deanna, and David, anything else to contribute to that? Um, Dave, I don't know if you wanted to add something, but I, I would say, I think that there is a, a, uh, another thing to remember is the contamination of the groundwater that we also know it's happening and that's why in many many times we see that even uh, outside of uh, rain events that bring in uh, direct contamination from overland flow many sites have groundwater contamination that we see in like the summertime at base low conditions and that will be hard to it's going to take some time right for that to flush out just like we see with nitrate and other pollutants. So they are in the groundwater now, and uh, in, in some cases, it will take some time. But yes, addressing um, the municipal practices uh, will eventually uh, make a huge, uh, significant difference. It's just that it might take some time in some cases. Great, thank you, Deanna. And we had another question from that same participant who is asking and wondering, is there a normal volume of water that a stream holds, an amount of stormwater that drains into a stream formula with a suggested maximum environmentally safe amount of road salt applied formula to suggest any road salt application standards? This is a real problem right now in Pennsylvania and across the nation, road salt and how we can better regulate it. Um, well, the short answer is yes, uh, and this kind of the kind of data that we are collecting is what the, what we would need to do something like this. Of course, it's uh, you know it'd be very complicated, but we uh, we have a lot of pieces that we need for that. We have a very good idea what the conductivity is and how we can relate that to salinity or salt concentrations. Um, we also have. Uh, really good understanding of the hydrology so we can actually calculate loads or model them and then uh, based on toxicology um, studies we can set up uh, thresholds and say okay this is you know the maximum saline uh, concentrations and of course this is you know already some of this is, is already part of uh, regulations and, and EPA studies and things like that but yeah, we, we could definitely do that and so be able to back calculate, okay, this is this is the amount of salt that can, you know, you cannot um, exceed this threshold, otherwise the concentrations will be too high at certain times of the year. Um, but uh, we have, you know, we have to get to that point in which municipalities are, are willing to do that and take uh, the recommendations. Great. Thank you, Deanna, Mark, David, anything else on that question as well? Brilliant. All right, so this next question, uh, and all of our panelists as well can pop into the Q&A if they want to read them for themselves and see them repeated. But this is from someone who is wondering, what was the cause of the random, um, I think they were the conductivity spikes, the EC spikes, that was uncorrelated with rain events at Montgomery School? It is... Sorry. Uh, Dave, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, clicked my video off instead of unmuting myself. Um, you know, uh, two master watershed stewards um, were going out and trying to sleuth that whole scenario and 
I believe that the uh, inputs that we were registering in the conductivity data stopped <laughs> before they could um, figure out the source. I think they had some ideas, but um, I, I, as far as I know, they weren't actually able to figure that out because the, 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 the spikes in conductivity actually stopped before they were able to figure it out. All right, sorry, I'm looking at one other question for us. Thank you, Dave. I didn't know if Mark wanted to give an attempt at that one, but it's more knowledge. So unfortunately, some of these questions, um, they might be something we look into later, and they do have in the chat the contact information for all three of our main presenters. But we have one other really great question that is about Great Marsh, which is another place that water chemistry and measurements are being conducted. And at Great Marsh, we, GMI, I'm not sure what GMI stands for, what group that is, have noticed Great large, Institute, I'm yeah. sorry, Dave? That's Great Marsh Institute. Institute, fantastic. And Dave Bressler, you can see this question in the chat um, as open. They've noticed large variations in the baseline conductivity on different tributaries to Marsh Creek, um, varying from 60 to as high as around 300. There is no significant urban activity, but we do have agricultural fields. So my question is, could the variation be due to agriculture, forest cover, or geology, or could it be due to all three? Um, I can speak briefly to that. Um, I, I know, I'm not sure which trips tributaries Jim is talking about, but I know there are some that are near the turnpike, so I don't think he mentioned that, but the turnpike certainly gets a lot of salt runoff directly into Great Marsh and potentially into those streams, so it could be that, um, but it also could just be a mix of the things that he mentioned. But I know um, we, we actually measured conductivity in some just standing water and small tribs near the turnpike going into the Great Marsh, and there was high conductivity there. Do you mean even during like the, without rain, rain events, you were yeah. seeing high conductivity? Yeah, that was just, that was um, just kind of at, at, you know, normal base. Flow. Sounds like they're saying it all year round and there is not significant urban activity. So we could presume that the traffic uh, on main roadways is not as high as it would be elsewhere. Um, so if you had to take a guess, would it, you attribute it more to agriculture, forest cover, or geology, or all three? Or is that really something you just need more comparative data down the road to, to answer? Well, I would say that um, in the geology, uh, we would have to have, would have to look at a map, a geologic map, and see. I mean, there, it is possible that geolo geology changes that much within a small um, scale, and that that uh, could be driving some, driving some of the very local variation. But if you do have ag, we also have seen that that is a one, you know, a major driver. So in general sites that have a uh, higher percentage of agriculture in the watershed, we do see higher ba uh, base, base flow or um, average conductivity throughout the year. Um, so I would say likely agriculture is, um, agriculture activities are part of, of the right. cost. And as we think about this, it opens up, you know, some really great dialogue that we're still conducting research in order to enrich about what can we do with road salt and how can we find sustainable alternatives, how can we find better regulations, and how can we consider what these practices are doing to our watershed health. And we have a question from someone wondering, are there any practical substitutes for road salt? Or is it a matter of just being more efficient with the salt that we do use? Um, I can I can add something to that. I don't know if Dave or Mark um, want to uh, pitch in, but uh, as far as I know, there is no agricultural substitute. Um, some of the, but but it, but it really is more about you know being more efficient on how it is used. And I think many of you probably know that in many cases municipalities are just given a certain amount of salt that they need to use throughout the year and if they don't they don't get it next year and that ha you know tends to drive a lot of this problem is they um the municipalities are just out there using the salt because they have to and 
if that was different, I think that would, you know, would be, uh, um, would make a, a, a positive impact. Uh, but in general, yes, better, better management, I think would, would really help. Um, I think that we don't understand well, well yet what are uh, more toxic and less toxic salts. And so I think that is one thing that if we, we had a, a really good understanding would be good because then, uh, you know, you can regulate what uh, kinds of salts can or cannot be used. Though, of course, they depend on the place where you are. If the temperatures get really low, then you want certain kinds of salts. Um, so. Great. Thank you, Deanna. Yeah. And there's, um, if I could just add on to that, there's also, you know, certain other practices like, um, you know, and it's not a, it does, it's not going to solve everything, but strategic use of brine, um, as well as just the, there seems to be quite a few uh, technology developments with regard to things like plows and these so-called live edge plows that get a better contact with the road and just actually are better able to physically move the snow and ice to the side of the road so that you need less in order to, um, you know, get the roads clear, need less salt to get the roads clear. Yeah. Yeah, these are great points and it's why the research is so important as we try and find better answers for questions like that. And there are just two more questions that we're going to answer. We are at 231, so we're going to answer them with brevity. And any other questions that we can't get to at this time or answer adequately, I really encourage you to reach out to Mark, Deanna, and David. They're all excellent research scientists on our staff team, so they'd love to hear from you. But one of these questions that's pretty important is, is there real-time alert monitoring by location, which is something I know David could really answer, uh, that could be shared with the DEP and local authority to check on the outputs of business and municipal wastewater. This could tell if a piece of the business's machinery is broken, along with a lot of other pollutant concerns, so that the DEP or others can request the facility to shut down or check their equipment. So two-part question, are we getting real-time monitoring data by location? And then secondly, how can we or do we share that data with authorities to have accountability for any sources of pollution? Um, I can speak to the first question. Um, you know, as far as monitor my watershed is concerned, there is no real way to, you know, set that up right now to, for, you know, alerts whenever you exceed some, you know, number that you set. Um, you know, who knows where we go with the capacity of monitor my watershed, maybe some time down the line that could be set up. Now, there are some groups, um, the uh, Rob Tuttle with the Delaware Nature Conservancy, he's a steward that works with them, he has um, developed his own sort of R programming to give them alerts um, as to when things are happening. Um, but that is currently not built in to monitor my watershed. It's, it's more dependent on just having, you know, we like to have, we like to recommend that there's at least one person with each station who regularly is checking the station data, like once a day, ideally, and someone is just looking and seeing what's going on on a daily basis. Mark and Deanna, unless you have something big for that question, that filters nicely into the last one we have for the day. All right, so this last one is related to that note that you mentioned, David, and why volunteers are so important to the accountability and maintenance of these technologies. Have you been able to isolate locations where there is 99% positive chance of negative anomalies to suggest maybe it's worth a volunteer checking that location because there could be a spill or something and I know with us, we may do that more with stormwater events, um, but how would you best answer that question, David? Um, just reading it again. Uh, I'm not sure I'm totally understanding the question. Um, you know, with the conductivity and the temperature data, um, you don't see a lot of anomalies. So it, it sort of is a, you know, you develop a relationship with the data, with the station, and you start to know like um, the, the patterns and you, you can, you know, really understand what looks like a, just a bad data point versus um, what's real. I mean, that type of thing just points to the need, to the importance of quality control and cross-checking the station data against, you know, a handheld, calibrated handheld meter. 
Um, but generally, the conductivity, as Mark and Diana both pointed out, the conductivity and temperature data are pretty reliable. You certainly need to pay attention to it in clean sensors, but um, the vast majority of the data coming off of those sensors are accurate and real as opposed to anomalies. Great. And during times like storms, where we think there could be a big input of pollutants in the waterway, um, it does mean that volunteers may be more mindful of checking out their station and like David talked about, ensuring it hasn't fouled doing other maintenance. Um, but unfortunately, it is afraid to wrap up our session. So I really want to thank our speakers and our scientists for taking the time to share their breadth of experience with us during yet another day of Watershed Congress presentations. And I also encourage you to virtually tour the Watershed Congress's virtual exhibit hall. All in one place, there is a link in the chat for this. You can find more information about supporters like Stroud Water Research Center, other opportunities to connect with those partners and resources for your work. And excitingly, there is a reminder that this session is recorded and others like it that are recorded will be made available on the 2020 Watershed Congress playlist on the Delaware Riverkeeper Network's YouTube channel. And you might even find some pre-recorded content already there. So go ahead and check it out. Link is also in the chat. And finally, we really hope the session sparked new and maybe familiar enthusiasm for freshwater research that will just continue to burn brightly throughout the entire week of Virtual Watershed Congress. So check your email or calendar for additional session invites, and we hope to virtually bump into you again in another session. Otherwise, big thank you to Dave, Deanna, and Mark, and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.